Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 36 of Break the Cycle with me, your host, Joshua Smith. I hope everyone is having a wonderful evening. I know I am because I actually get a three-day weekend after uh, a long work day today. So anytime I get some extra time off with my kids, you know I'm stoked. Uh, but anyways, we've got a great show for you tonight. We'll definitely start off with some sponsors. We have Lorenzotti.coffee for all your delicious Italian coffee needs delivered directly to your door. Bring the taste of Italy home. Use BTC at checkout for a 10% discount. Of course, toplobster.com, the man, the myth, the legend, where you can get this awesome Break the Cycle custom embroidered logo hat, this Disobey Your Local Tyrant shirt, and of course, the custom BTC pillow, part of the couch stream you can bring home to your own couch now. Pretty cool stuff. Use BTC at checkout for a 10% discount. And anthemplanning.com for all your emergency and crisis planning needs. Uh, check these people out. See what they can do for your business, your personal life, anything. These people are amazing. Uh, Mises Caucus owners, uh, Delaware Libertarians, awesome, awesome people. But anyways, uh, I want to get right into the show tonight. I am super stoked once again to bring back uh, a man who I, I respect a great deal. Uh, we had uh, not an argument per se, but we had a small disagreement online about uh, some pictures f uh, surrounding the Waco um, tragedy that happened when I was very young, um, and he kind of set me straight on some things, so I wanted to bring him on, talk about that today, since we, we've already had him on to talk about his book and, and all that stuff, but he is uh, uh, the, 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 the founder of antiwar.com. Uh, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm not editorial director. Editorial, editorial director. director. He's back there somewhere. Uh, he is the author of Enough Already, uh, Time to End the War on Terrorism. He is Scott Horton. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm Listen, trying to give you a better Eric, intro, man. No, no, no. It's fine. I just want to make sure that Eric Garris gets the credit. Right, he right. is the man. He's the founder of antiwar.com. He's run it this whole time. And of course, Justin Raimondo was our head writer for many, many years. Um, but now it's it's Eric. And then the news department is led by the heroic Jason Ditz, Dave DeCamp, and this new guy, Rick Rozoff, that we have writing for us, who's an expert on all things Eastern Europe. And then Kyle Anzalone is the opinion editor who uh, runs all the contributing columns and the Daily Viewpoint section. And all those guys get the credit for making the page what it is every day. And it is the most important website on the Internet, antiwar.com. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I was I was totally, you know, I know what you do, Scott. I've introduced. I just you want to make sure the boys times. get the credit. And then I, was like, I do a lot of interviews. <laughs> I get a lot. I do a lot of interviews. And I think people assume that I play a bigger role on the site than I do at this point. And I just want to make sure they get the credit for the work that they're doing because they're the ones really doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, like I said, I know what you do and and uh, I've introduced you more than one time. So I should have known better. But anyways, uh, no, so, that's fine. so we had this little disagree. It wasn't really disagreement. I, I was talking about uh, David Chipman, who is likely to be the, the head of the ATF. Uh, he was definitely yeah. he was definitely involved in Waco. Um, there's a there's a famous picture uh of uh an atf agent standing around smoldering ashes um and there's definitely bodies in the picture that have burned up and it's always kind of just been as far as i'm concerned and a lot of other people uh it's just kind of been recognized that that was him in that picture and, and when i posted it and talked about it you said that that's a lie and it's not true so i want to get some more information from you uh, about waco i actually did my first episode of break the cycle the video the video version about Waco. I, you know, I, I, great. I knew quite a bit about Waco, but I went and watched a great, wonderful, uh, documentary called the rules of engagement. Um, yes. It made one of the best documentaries, probably the best info about that, that, that whole entire ordeal that you can find. Um, and I did my first episode. It was a great episode. I, re I really, you know, I didn't know what I was doing yet as far as podcasting went, but, um, so I just have always just kind of thought that that was him but so so i mean where where are you and and as far as waco goes where what i mean i'm sure you have way more knowledge of it than i do but what you know who is do you know who that person in the picture is no not exactly but let me clear up a couple things first of all my first show was about waco too okay, so. that was in 1998 <laughs> and um i actually back in the 1990s i used to be a regular guest on the alex jones show when he was still on the fm like 1996 97 era to talk about waco and i give him credit for really spearheading an effort and got he organized a lot of people with his radio show 
to come together and rebuild their church, their chapel for them on that property there in 1999 and 2000, which was really awesome. And I played a small part in that. I'm not taking credit for it, but I, I'm proud to have been associated with all that. Um, but so as far as I'm going to talk all about what was going on there, but I think you're just in your question, even you assume that the person in that picture was ATF, but that is a huge stretch right there. And the fact of the matter is that if anyone from ATF was around with a rifle shooting at anybody or killing anybody on April the 19th, then that they were off the books. They were acting as, you know, private unpaid hitmen getting revenge, which is possible that the FBI and the Army Delta Force let a couple of ATF agents come and get revenge for their fallen friends, but without badges, you know, something like that. But there's no evidence that that happened. None. That's pure speculation that any ATF agent would have been on the scene or involved in any way in what happened in the assault on April the 19th. That was the FBI. You know, ATF did the raid on the first day on February the 28th. The FBI took over that night. And, you know, at that it's different now. But at that time, ATF was under Treasury. And so once the Justice Department led by the FBI came in, they're out. And so then that was it. And then the FBI ruled the place for six weeks. And then the FBI and the Army Delta Force went in there and exterminated those people, killed 86 of them. OK, and so then there's every reason, Josh, then to think that whoever is in that picture is an FBI agent hostage rescue team, which is essentially special operations forces just working for the FBI or a member of the Army Delta Force. It's much likely a member of the Army Delta Force because I don't think they would be posing. That's top tier special operations forces. They don't pose for pictures over burnt Texas corpses, I don't think. And you mentioned the movie Waco, the Rules of Engagement. In that movie, Mike McNulty identifies them as members of the hostage rescue team. Sure. And there's three different pictures. I'm almost certain there's three different pictures of, of trophy pictures of them standing with rifles, uh, three different men standing over a burnt corpse in the background and the ashes of the house there. And so then I when this started coming out, people just started saying it was Chipman. The first time anybody heard this guy's name is when he was nominated. Um, you know, I mean, other than maybe specialists knew who he was, but he had never been famous for any of this. Um, but he got nominated to lead the ATF and I don't know who was the first person who did it, but just somebody just said, well, that's him. Look, there he is. White guy with brown hair. It's gotta be him. What? That's a 30 year old picture. In fact, if you just probably add a, you know, do the ages of the guy in the picture there, and the 30 years, 28 years that have passed since then, then wouldn't Chipman be older than he is right now? I mean, just on the face of that, I'm not sure, but that was 30 years ago. And anyway, there's just no reason to believe that he was involved in, in the action, that the assault that they said it wasn't, that took place on April the 19th, which was the hostage rescue team and the Delta Force. So then I contacted the archivists at the library at Baylor University, and they went digging through the archives and they couldn't find it anywhere. And I contacted Dan Gifford, you know, Mike McNulty is dead now, but I contacted Dan Gifford, who was the producer of Waco, the Rules of Engagement, and Waco, A New Revelation. And I interviewed him on my show. And I forget now if we talked about this on the show or not, I think we must have, that he couldn't verify who that was. But if you go back and watch the movie, and actually I didn't go back and watch the movie, but I did read at PolitiFact, they quoted McNulty from the movie saying here, these images portray the attitude of the hostage rescue team that standing over their vanquished enemy, something along those lines. And then here's what we actually do know about Chipman was that he was brought in to help prosecute the case against the survivors in the trial in right. San Antonio mm -hmm. on the on the conspiracy to murder ATF agents and murder of ATF agents. Uh, charges. And so in, in essence, <clears throat> well, I'll get to that in a second, but just to stick to the story here, as far as anyone knows, there's no record of him being at Waco at all. And when they asked him, um, about it, he said that one of the reasons that he was brought in to help prosecute the case was because up until then he hadn't had anything to do with it. 
And so anyone who was involved in seeking the warrant, anyone who was involved in setting up the raid, that those people, you wouldn't want to have them on the prosecution team. You want to bring in a fresh group of people without a conflict of interest there to make the best case on their behalf. You know, you being, in this case, the ATF taking care of their own people, right? So that was his his association here. And and honestly, the only thing in the world linking him to the guy in the image is that he's a white guy with brown hair, period, full stop. That's it. So you did it too. And so did I. And so did everybody. It's totally crazy. It's nothing. It's, it's you know, substanceless speculation. And then you have this hack journalist from the Daily Mail, which if you don't know, is has a reputation, of course, of being like the National Enquirer. It is a tabloid and they're sloppy as hell all the time. And so this lady, I think Carolyn something, put out this thing and in her article, she claimed we confirmed it, that it's Chipman in the picture. But she didn't confirm shit. And I sent her a direct message on Twitter and said, tell me how you confirm this, because I'm doing the work. I'm calling, I got the guy at Baylor University running to the other building to dig through the file cabinet for me right now. So tell me how you confirm this. And she says, well, the photo desk confirmed it. And I said, okay, great. Well, tell me how the photo desk confirmed it. Could you please ask them how it was that they confirmed it? Because I would also like to confirm it, please. Because if this guy is standing gloating over the corpses of burnt branch Davidian children, I want to know about that. Okay? So please tell me how it is that this was confirmed. Crickets. Nothing. And the answer being she's full of shit. And the so-called photo desk, they went and looked at your Twitter. So, well, Josh <laughs> seems to think so. And that'll be good enough for them. Sure. Right? And then I got good libertarians going, well, it was in the Daily Mail. Yeah, so what? It was in the Daily Mail. Meanwhile, this guy is employed by the federal government these last 30 years after helping to prosecute the Branch Davidians. You know what that means? That means that the people who conspired to raid and kill and prosecute the Branch Davidians were never held accountable. Right. They're still in government. And if this guy's job was carrying coffee for the people who prosecuted the Branch Davidians, he should be exiled from this country forever, much less promoted to be the director of the ATF. But then look what happens when you swing and you miss, Adam Josh, is he goes in his first, the whole first part of his confirmation hearing is about how that's not true. That's not me. I didn't have anything to do with that. I was brought in later for the prosecution. Everybody knows that. It's in my records. In fact, PolitiFact showed where he had delivered to the Senate, I guess, and they passed on or, or he maybe sent it to them, uh, a memo from his boss telling him they want him to pack up and move and go to Texas. And it's I forgot the date on it, but it's like April 20th or whatever. You know what I mean? In other words, in context, it shows that he wasn't there. They were telling him to get started now after the fact, which is perfectly reasonable and plausible. And again, there's no indication whatsoever opposite. No indication whatsoever opposite. And, you know, people on Twitter, when this first came out, the first day this came out, I wasted a whole morning arguing with people about this. And all their arguments were, well, it looks like him to me. And that's good enough for me. And he was involved in Waco somehow. Well, then I don't care. And then, so this guy had done an AMA where he falsely claimed the Branch Davidians had shot down a helicopter with a 50 yeah. caliber rifle, which Jeez. is not true. Not they all. hit it and it landed to check for damage, but it wasn't shot down in any sense. You know, that was a lie. But anyway, in that Ask Me Anything on Reddit, he held up a sign that said, hey, I'm David Shipman, ATF, ask me anything, right? And so people were photoshopping in the house burning down and stuff like that. This is just Reddit fun. This is... Um, or, or Twitter fun, this is memes, right? We know, hopefully anyone looking at that picture knows that he's not really standing there with this giant grin holding a picture of the burning church full of people, right? Like that's a meme, that's, a that's just somebody being a, a jerk to him and he deserves it, fine, right? But this is different. This is people are, this is not a meme, this is people are taking this seriously and they're falsely accusing this guy. So then he got to go before the Senate and spend the whole first part of his confirmation hearing saying, I'm being falsely accused of something I didn't do. Right. Which makes him the good guy and us the bad guys. With proof to what? back it up. Yeah. But it, 
But but he prosecuted the Branch Davidians. He's the goddamn bad guy. Right. He's the very, very, very bad guy for doing that. He's our enemy. He is proof that Joe Biden, and his entire government, they hate our guts. That they would dare to promote a guy that had anything to do with this. To be the director of the ATF. Are you kidding me? It's an atrocity. And now look at us. We spent the whole first part of this thing talking about false accusations against a horrible, guilty man who is now going to succeed in being promoted. Because instead of the argument against him being, you son of a bitch, you prosecuted those people who were acquitted, by the way. Yeah, they all got off. Because they were defending themselves, because they didn't murder and ambush federal agents. They were the victims of the ATF. And as sad as it was that the four ATF agents died, they killed six innocent Branch Davidians in their attack who did nothing to them whatsoever in what was called Operation Showtime. Right. Because it was a publicity stunt in the first place at their expense. Yeah, it was all about as drumming up. Went, it was all the about. Same went at oh, the sorry. time, Josh. They could have arrested David Koresh when he went jogging in the morning. They could have arrested him when he went to Walmart once a week. Everybody knew that. Right. This whole thing was a show on purpose at their expense. And the ATF fired first and the jury found them not guilty. Now, we can talk more about the case in a minute, but. The point being that these people were innocent victims. This was not the Charles Manson cult. This is, you know, preparing for Helter Skelter and the apocalypse and ready to march on downtown Waco and take it over. These were good people. And you can see in those documentaries, you see the local sheriff saying, these are good folks, man. This wasn't some crazy cult. You might not believe in their exact same breakoff group of the Pentecostal type uh, you know, facet of the Protestant uh, sects Seven, of Christianity. Seventh day, seventh day Adventist. Lots of, yeah. yeah, you know what? Like, if you're a Protestant, never mind Catholics or any other kinds of religions, but just if you're a Protestant, you have severe disagreements with every other kind of Protestant, and there's like 30 of them, right? Or 100. So this is, these guys, they're a break off of the Seventh-day Adventist church. I'm not even sure how related to the Pentecostals that is. Pardon me. They're a break off of the Seventh-day Adventist church. They live in this little commune on the edge of town. And then what do they do? Nothing. Right. They commit crimes. They sell drugs. They hurt people. But they didn't do they, any of that. They conspire to use their weapons to kill cops. All of these are lies. Lies. None of it was true. Let me tell you something. The morning of the raid, Josh, a guy named Paul Fatta, F-A-T-T-A, he left, the, the raid was like, uh, almost nine o'clock, or pardon me, almost eight, maybe. I think it was almost nine. It was like late in the morning. But Paul Fatta left at six or seven o'clock that morning in a dually pickup truck with a camper on it, towing a U-Haul trailer, both full of rifles. Sure. Okay, you hear me? 99% of the Branch Davidians firearms left that property that morning with Paul Fatta. Was he going to arm the Nazi militia to blow up the world? No, he was coming to Austin, Texas, to the old Best building at Sheridan and 290, the famous Best Banks, if you're a skateboarder, right there. And this was the Saxit gun show. And as far as I know, they still have it once a month over there. Uh, they used to have it all the time. And, and so, in other words, he was going to sell guns. He was one of 50,000, you know, gun dealers in Texas sure. who sold guns for a living. That's it. So the Branch Davidians, one of their side businesses was buying and selling weapons. Now, maybe if you're from Massachusetts, that's terrifying to you. <laughs> but in Texas, people buy and sell weapons to each other. And, and nobody's thinking about homicidal intent, Right. Guns are for defending your family if it comes down to it. Otherwise, they're for shooting at things for fun. You don't kill people with them. You know what I mean? What are you talking about? And certainly not with rifles, you know, uh, not in Texas. People don't murder each other with rifles in Texas. This is a this is a perfect. It might as well be selling gallons of milk. OK, it's a perfectly legitimate business. And that was the morning of the raid. The guy left and then he finds out about the raid. Oh, no, there was a violent raid on my home. While I was gone, he calls the ATF, says, I'm Paul Fatta. I'm the guy with the guns. Are you guys looking for me? Should I turn myself in? This is what Charles Manson, you know, crazy uh, cultist criminals these people are. 
are you guys looking for me? They go, no, Paul Fatty, you're cool. We're not, you're not on our list. You're fine. And then later they prosecute him for conspiracy to murder federal agents and put him in prison. I told you they were acquitted, True. Yep. Yep. but they went to prison anyway, Josh. You want to know how? I wasn't aware of that. So here's what happened. The jury refused to convict them for murder and right. conspiracy to murder federal agents. There's no way are we doing that. But there are a couple of thin blue line guys on the jury. I'd have to go back, but I believe it was two of them were just no way. We love cops types. And which, you know what? Only two of them on a San Antonio jury. That's pretty good. Yeah. And, you know, anyway. Um, but so they said, no, we got to convict them of something. And this happens to people all the time. The jury compromises. I got to get home to my kids. Fine. You know what? Fine. Well, here's what we'll do. We'll go ahead and find them guilty on the lesser charge. So they refused to convict them of murder or conspiracy to commit murder, but they compromised and convicted them for using a firearm in the commission of a felony. So the judge hears this and the judge says, well, I'm dismissing that because how can you convict them for using a firearm in the commission of a felony if you acquit them of the felony? Right. And that's inconsistent. And so I'm going to sit on this for the weekend, but it looks like, you know, I'm going to have to dismiss, you know, overturn this conviction somehow. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but this, this isn't going to be able to stand. Then he comes back after the weekend and he says, no, you know what? I thought about it. And what I decided was you really meant to convict him of murder. And if you're finding him guilty of using a firearm in the commission of a felony, then you must be finding them guilty of that felony. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sentence them as though you convicted them of murder of federal agents. And then he put these people in or gave them the maximum he possibly could on the firearms charge, which was like 15 years each for these people, for almost all of them got you know maximum 10 and 15 year sentences for the, the firearms charge because he held the, the guilt for the murder of the cops against them, even though they'd been acquitted on that. Jeez. And so use that as the loophole. And then they did decades in prison. Some of them did 20 years, I think. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. These are the survivors. These are the ones who weren't butchered right. and shot and burned and bombed by the ATF. Uh, pardon me, by the FBI hostage rescue team and the Army Delta Force. Sure. And I, well, and I watched, you know, I watched a lot of the hearings after after Waco took place. And there was two distinct reports. I mean, you talked a little bit about the Treasury. There was a Treasury report. And the and the uh, um, oh god the Treasury report and what was the, the, the Danforth just, report the, the ju- oh or the Justice, oh, the Justice yeah Depo- the Justice Department uh-huh. report and they didn't right. they were completely different the reports were different and and so I mean just that alone just hearing that alone kind of made me think but I, but I had no idea see I thought the F- ATF was more involved in the raid um, and I I know in that- the first yeah yeah no 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 now remember the reason Waco was such a big deal at the time because cops kill people all the time. It wasn't even just the fire. It was the 51 day siege, right? Six weeks, right? So the ATF did the raid on the 28th. That was entirely their show. But once they, they essentially lost the battle and withdrew from the property. And so then the siege set in and then the FBI came. And once the FBI came, then it's just like on TV, this is our jurisdiction now, buddy, elbow, you got to go. Right. And that was that was from the first day. And they ruled the place for the next six weeks. And then they were the ones who, with the army, killed those people. Well, and as as Dan Gifford said to me, it's probably it's possible. I don't know about likely, but it's possible that the British SAS were also involved in exterminating the the Davidians there that day. I got to tell you. I mentioned at the beginning the, the possibility that ATF agents were allowed to go back there and participate in the killing, too. And I guess I can tell you that I've heard that before um, as someone claimed to know that to me before, but I don't have any confirmation of that. And I, and honestly, I don't have any real reason to believe that that's true. Well, you I know, don't. I think that I think because I think the FBI would be taking too big of a risk in letting some ATF agents tear their badge off and just go back there and shoot people for fun. I don't think it was like that. I think the FBI was like, we're going to take care of this. And then they did. Well, and then in those reports, it basically said that the FBI never fired a single bullet. Oh, well, yeah, that was a damn lie. And, or if that's true, then it was all Delta force because honestly, 
we don't know for sure the identity of which individual men are the ones pulling triggers in the back. We do have multiple confirmation that Delta Force was involved in, as Stephen Barry put it, pulling triggers in the in and as Gene Cullen, the former CIA officer, put it, uh, were involved in a firefight that they were told that by Delta Force operators themselves that they had they didn't say it was all us and not the HRT. Right. So the implication was that it was the two together. You know, certainly the the HRT was in charge of the tanks and, and the overall operation. Sure. And I think something else that is literally not talked about enough uh, that revolves around all this is this was right before they were getting ready to have like hearings on on funding for uh, was it, was it the FBI or maybe the ATF? For the ATF. It was the ATF. Yeah, no. Right? So listen. Right. This is a month and a week into Clinton's presidency. OK, this is a very, you know, the end of February, 93. And part of the whole theme of the Clinton presidency coming in was reinventing government. Right. We've got this wonky wonk Senator Al Gore as vice president, and he's going to be in charge of cutting waste, fraud and abuse. Right. This marginal kind of crap that they push. And so as part of that, I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody had suggested that they put ATF take it away from Treasury and put it under the Justice Department. And by doing that, that makes them even the smaller, younger brother to the FBI, right? That diminishes their position in relationship to the other federal police agencies even more. So they were desperate to try to turn that around. And something that um, the the new uh, people, you know, the documentary about Waco and the miniseries, I guess it was the miniseries about Waco, which I think really had a, a, a not satisfactory ending to sure. it, but started out really strong. And I think one of the narratives that they got right there, that was something that I think I had overlooked for a long time, was in the connection between Ruby Ridge and Waco. It wasn't just here are two horrible things that these guys have done kind of a deal, which is sort of the way it was always talked about. Um, but Waco was a result of Ruby Ridge in the sense that it was the ATF who originally framed Randy Weaver. They had an informant convince him, like really badger the hell out of him, into selling him a sawed off shotgun. And so then once they did that, then they said, all right, now we got you by the balls and we want you to be an informant for us. And he was like, no, and refused to do it. So then they charged him with the firearms charge, but then they deliberately sent him the wrong court date. So when he didn't show up for his court date, then they had a warrant out for his arrest for avoiding his court date. They sent the federal marshals to his house to surveil him, but the dog picked up the scent, ran after him. The cops panicked, killed the dog, killed Sammy Weaver, who was, I believe, a, the 14-year-old yeah, boy, but he looked boy. like he was 12. He was, I'm sorry? Yeah, he was a young young boy, yeah. Oh, okay. Some, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it was 14 at the time. And then they wounded a guy who, I'm almost sure his name was Kevin Smith, who was the family friend. Uh, who was uh, who was with them uh, with the the son that day, and then of course the FBI again the hostage rescue team same sniper and tank driver from Waco Lon Horiuchi is the guy that took the shot that blew uh, Vicky Weaver's head off frankly uh, holding her baby in her arms, and um, anyway but here's the point of it right the ATF got the marshals and the FBI into a bunch of trouble in that one. That was the way the marshals and particularly, I guess, the FBI looked at it was this was all their fault, even though it was the FBI agent who shot the woman in the head and it was the marshal who shot the boy in the back. But it was the ATF stupid job in trapping this guy and trying to turn him into an informant that had caused the whole problem. And so inside the federal cop fraternity, ATF got the black eye. The whole thing was their fault, not ours. And that was the dominant narrative. So that was one of the things that ATF was trying to overcome. They were also being sued, and it was on 60 Minutes, that there was a real problem of racism and sexism inside the ATF. And some of the uh, ATF agents had been photographed uh, at a, I forgot what it was called, I think it was some kind of jubilee something, but I don't think they meant debt forgiveness by yeah. that. I don't know what the hell it was. But it was some it was some like a white supremacist gathering in the deep south somewhere where these ATF agents were pictured selling N word hunting licenses, as they were called. Uh, I wouldn't quote it, but you know what I mean. And so 
And then and they were being sued by black and female employees of the ATF were suing them for all their discrimination. So here come the PC Hillary Clintonites with their Captain Planet and baby blue UN flag and all of this, you know, you think PC is PC now. That's exactly how the whole spirit of the time was in 1993 as the Clintons were coming in, you know. And so the ATF were looking to improve their status a little bit because they were being put up on Al Gore's chopping block. And they had, as as I think you correctly said there, they had an appropriations hearing coming up in two weeks. And so this is what they were going to do. They were going to attack this mullet headed trans am driving redneck and show these Democrats that see we're with you. And now here's an interesting contradiction there. As Dan Gifford told me, the producer, again, of Waco, the Rules of Engagement and Waco, a new revelation. He went to the bar in D.C. where all these ATF guys, I think it was in D.C., he said, where all these ATF guys drink at night. And he went and drank and hang out with it and hung out with them. And they told him that one of the reasons that they targeted David Koresh was because they were white supremacists. And David Koresh was guilty of the sin of miscegenation because he was alleged to be sleeping with many of the black members of the church there. And, you know, a lot of the left, I think, saw this guy's Trans Am and mullet head and said, oh, this guy's such a right wing redneck. They just didn't even entertain the possibility or the likelihood that fully like a third of the population of that church compound there, that that commune there were black. And including I think it was uh, Martin Smith was the second black man ever to graduate Harvard Law School, right. was there as a religious scholar. And he's the guy that calls 911. In fact, if you want, I'll play the audio for you of him calling 911. Should I do that? I could play it right through. It'll pipe right through, Josh. Yeah, if you want. Of him calling 911 during the original ATF raid. Yeah, it'll pick up any audio uh, you play. So. Yeah, so well, let me see if I can pull it up easily here. Uh, and while you're while you're doing that, uh, we got a couple super chats. Jake Riley, per, you, you actually went right into what the super chats were asking, so that's perfect. But Jake Riley said, "Have either of you two done research into Ruby Ridge and how the ATF bungled that situation?" Yes, uh, Scott has yes. done a lot. I have done a little. Let me bit. say one more thing about that. Let me say one more thing about that. Alan Bach, who also used to write for AntiWar.com, he died some years ago now. He's such a wonderful guy. And Alan Bach wrote a book called. Um, uh, um, uh, ambush at Ruby Ridge and is absolutely fantastic. And I actually met Randy Weaver at a gun show in uh, Colorado in 1998. I'm sure the FBI has pictures of that, so that's fine. Um, and I asked him, hey, what did you think of Alan Bach's book, Ambush at Ruby Ridge? He said, it's fantastic. It's the best book on the story right there. That's a direct quote from Weaver, the victim there. And I'm telling you, I vouch for it. That book is absolutely fantastic. If you want to know about Ruby Ridge, that's the book, Ambush at Ruby Ridge by Alan Bach. And he's a hardcore one of us, hardcore libertarian, wrote for the Orange County Register and antiwar.com. He's not like a right-wing militia guy talking about his reminiscences or something like that. It's great journalism. And now listen to this. This is what happened at the start of the raid when the ATF showed up on February the 28th that morning. What is this? This isn't VLC player. What are you doing to me? Uh God dang it, Bobby. This thing has decided to change my default thingamajig here now. <laughs> and that ain't right. Where is open with? Here we go. Yeah, seems kind of crazy that that uh, you'd call the cops and tell them that you know there's women and children here. Please stop firing at us. If you were the ones that initiated the firing, you know. Well, and the local sheriff, you notice he calls him Wayne. He goes, "Oh, it's Wayne." Yeah. So the 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 sheriffs and the deputies, they're not in control of this. They have no, and they have they don't even have the ability to call the ATF in the field and say, "I have them on the phone. They're begging for a ceasefire." 
There's no communication with the local authorities whatsoever. ATF just rolls into town and does this without working with them at all. True. And then so you can hear the old man that answers the phone down at the call center. He goes, who is this? It's Wayne. Tell me what's happening, Wayne. He knows him. He knows him. This is the second black man to graduate Harvard Law School. Right. It's the one call. He's the real Charles Manson cultist, this guy. Well, there was all calling 911 saying, help me, help me. I don't think a lot of people understand. There was a lot of there was actually quite a few scholars uh, at, at, in Waco. I mean, there was there. It wasn't just this. And that was one of the things that bugged me out the most, because, you know, I knew about this when I was a kid. I was a young kid when this happened. Right. Eight, nine years old. And I didn't know a lot about it, but I learned more about it over the years as it gone. But nothing that I ever learned was the absolute truth until I started really researching it myself a couple years ago. And uh, one of the things that was crazy to me to find out was these weren't a compound of loony people who were, uh, you know, uh, taking as many young children for sexual games and dr selling drugs and illegal guns. No, they were legal firearm dealers. Um, they were a, you know, they were just a break off of the seven day Adventist. It wasn't even that crazy. Uh, they weren't selling drugs or doing drugs at all from what I understand. And, right. and, and, and the local authorities found that there was nothing to the child abuse charges. I mean, and frankly, this is the law and I'm not saying that I agree with this whatsoever, but the law at the time, I think maybe even still is 16 is that in Texas with parental consent, yeah. 14 years old 14. is old enough. And I think that raises serious questions about the makeup of the Texas legislature over these past couple centuries, yeah. to be perfectly honest sure. with you. Um, but uh, it seems like that's something that could have been updated decades ago. Oh, what are they doing? This right. ain't the frontier days or what? I, I, don't, I have no idea how right. that's and I and I've never even was on the books in '93. I don't know if that's still the law now, but but they had been investigated. And look, I think it's clear that Koresh was taking liberties with his followers' wives sure. and saying, "Look, it says in the Bible here, I could screw your wife, pal," and getting away with that kind of thing. But that's not a crime. Sure. And and even again, even you know if. If it is true, the allegations about 14 and 15 and 16 year olds, that's a moral crime. I consider it one and I wouldn't mind throwing them off of something tall for that. I don't care. Sure. But but it wasn't a legal crime and it absolutely had nothing to do with the jurisdiction of the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms whatsoever. And the local Child Protective Services had been out there and had checked into it and had interviewed the kids and had not separated anyone at all and had found that it was fine. Well, in there, fact, was, in there the were second, several. There were several In the local second documentary, agencies. they interview the lady. In yeah. Waco, A New Revelation, they interview the lady from CPS. And she says, we went out there and we checked and it was okay. Yeah, there were several, we there were no several uh, local agencies that had actually been out there to check on numerous claims that they never found any uh, any kind of evidence and, of whatsoever. And, and part of it was there was a guy who was like a, a cult deprogrammer who hooked up with the ex-husband of a lady who didn't approve of her and her children being there, which you could understand his concern. Sure. But then this became the kind of thing, sort of like with the Daily Mail tabloid thing. Let's make a bunch of accusations and see what sticks and who cares, you know. And so that kind of then it becomes like on the tabloid news shows, a current affair, a crazy cult in Texas where this guy believes his crazy stuff. And what, you know, and then it has to be portrayed in that way. And so then, you know, the Dallas Morning News or was it the Waco Herald Tribune had started to run like as prep for the raid. I forgot this story. I forgot. No, I'm sorry, Josh. I have to go back and look now if this was like just in the weeks right before the raid or this was just after. I think it was before the raid. They started running this series, The Sinful Messiah. Oh, uh, yep, yep. It's, it's horrible David Koresh who controls these people and all this stuff. And, you know, honestly, Josh, I think if your sister had joined that group, you'd have marched down there and grabbed her and drug her right back out of there and said that, you know what, I don't like this. True. You know what I mean? True. Probably wasn't. It probably his the le his level of authority of those people to me cross my line for anyone in my family but send in the stormtrooper squad right. to decide this for other people no way man in china maybe true right and by the way small footnote bill clinton admitted under oath in 98 that really he told reno to go ahead he gave the order to reno to go ahead
And of course, he had to have given the order to the Delta Force because the attorney general doesn't control the Delta Force under any circumstances whatsoever. Right. Unless, I don't know, every other executive <laughs> official He's above dead. the or, or, or everyone else on the cabinet was dead. Yeah. And the attorney general was the sole survivor and has just been sworn in as president. That's the only way the attorney general could tell the Delta Force what to do. So we already knew this was Bill Clinton's fault anyway. They blamed her and she deserved the blame because she went along with it. She could have stopped it. She could have said, absolutely not. And she said, go ahead. But Thankfully, she took the there, uh, celestial discharge before she had a chance to burn down any more churches, you know? Yeah. I don't know what that means. The what does that mean? She died. Oh. <laughs> the celestial yeah. discharge. I don't understand stuff. <laughs> Listen, point being, Clinton, when he uh, gave the order, when he admitted, and it's in the logs, right? We know from the White House logs and everything from the lawsuits by Judicial Watch and the rest, that when Clinton was watching Waco burn, he was sitting on the couch with James Riotti, his Chinese intelligence connection who helped bankroll the campaign of 1996 who then he put his right-hand man, John Wong, in charge of licensing uh, missile technology transfers from Laurel and Hughes at the Commerce Department. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was, for people who remember the Clinton years, I, I know you were younger. I'm, I'm a few years older than you. I was, I was, I was uh, 15 or so when Waco happened. But in the Clinton years, there's this huge scandal about John Wong and James Riavi. And then what TV did, just like they would do today, I know you could understand and relate to it. What TV did was they just changed the subject to this guy named Charlie Tree and this other guy, you know, Wen Ho Lee, this this um, heroic, you know, loyal American scientist at a national laboratory who didn't do anything. And and they and a guy named Johnny Chung, another fundraiser named Johnny Chung. So they just said, well, look, all these Asians look alike to you. Right. So instead of talking about this huge, important scandal with John Wong and James Riotti. We're just going to talk about Charlie Tree and Johnny Chung and Wen Ho Lee instead, you dumbass Americans, and you're going to love it too. And that, and that was what happened, and it worked. And then everybody said, what's the big deal with Johnny Chung anyway? Raise a little bit of money. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, um, anyway, well, we got. he was watching Waco burn with his Chinese intelligence connections. Of course. Which, like, look at this. Like, you know, a, a Christian church without tax exempt status registration with the IRS, right? We're going to get them, which is exactly the kind of thing that you would expect to see in China. I don't know if the Chinese would have sent, you know, special operations forces to no. burn them and machine gun them. I don't the know Chinese, why not, The Chinese, the CCP would not have done it as badly as, as the Americans. They, they probably would have just gone in there and arrested people without firing a shot is what they probably would yeah, have done. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we got a few more. And then again, in China, chat. they wouldn't have been armed. The Davidians wouldn't have been armed. in the first No, place. there would have been. They definitely would have been gun dealers for sure. Um, we got a couple more uh, uh, super chats. Top Lobster says they sent that young black kid to the wrong Zoom court date recently. That's creepy. Uh, Drywall O says Scott Horton for CIA director. Ha, wouldn't that be fun? You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. <laughs> We're done. You're we're, fired. We're You're fired. I'm fired. We're closed. <laughs> That's it. I hereby resign. My work is done. Uh, Nolan Harris says, Scott, is there going to be an audio book for enough already? Yes, I'm working on it, man. I'm, I'm at Libya right now. And I'm sorry. I'm just so swamped doing everybody else's shows and, and not doing my own work. Well, you just got to do a pretty cool show. You were on uh, Timcast. That, that's a pretty big show, man. Yeah, that was a good deal. And I got to skate his mini ramp, too, which yeah, was also I rad. saw the pictures of that. I was like, oh, man, Scott and Tim Cass skating together. That's so cool. Yeah, it was cool. He's got a good uh, backside kick flip to pivot. I'll give him that. And he's got, uh, you know, on his flat ground tricks, he's got a nolly hard flip. And, I mean, his heel flips and kick flips are, are awesome, man. He catches them, you know, waist high or whatever. Oh, wow. And then, man, he had this killer. I don't know if you were ever a skater or anything, Josh, yeah. but I'm oh, just yeah. rambling. He, he had this thing. It was like a hang 10 flip, dude. So he's riding both feet together on the nose. I'm trying to remember if it was like nose manual. I guess not. He's just riding, you know, four wheels down, but both wheel, both feet facing forward on the nose. And then somehow, blam, popped some crazy nolly hard flip out of that. Yikes. Some crazy ass, you know, 180 heel flip thing, something or other. That, I have no idea. That's it was cool. really My, cool. I was, a, I was an okay skater. skater. My brother... Uh, who was like the really lazy stoner and and mm -hmm. uh, was like literally could do like hill flips on like 10 stair gaps and stuff like that. But he would he would only do it if you're like, hey, I'll give you an eighth. 
if you can do this. And then he'd go bust it, and then he'd go back home and smoke. He grew up with Corey Duffel, if you know who Corey Duffel is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, him and, uh-huh. him and Corey Duffel was like the younger kid that hung out with my, my brother's uh, crew, okay. and they were all like, you know, you're never going to be nothing or nothing or whatever. And that guy's been on the cover of magazines, and he's a huge skateboarder sure. now. But um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my brother was like the lazy stoner skater who could have easily been a huge pro skater and just just was right. too lazy to do it. So Isn't that cool? I've known guys like that, too, yeah. who – absolutely have the talent that they could have been among the very top of the best but had no interest whatsoever in being part of the skateboard business they just want to ride and drink beers and be happy now he's in the legal pot business in california makes tons of money man so (laughs) you know Uh, we got another super chat uh making sh- uh let's see uh the wars immoral says make sure to ask scott how killing the people of waco let them know that they could kill iraqis and syrians that's the most important thing thanks man yeah you know what um i think the first time i ever called a radio show uh i had this whole spiel i was gonna say and then right before they put me on they go you got five seconds before the top of the hour news beep <laughs> and i go <laughs> Uh, Waco was a test to see if we'd allow military operations in our neighborhoods and we all failed it. And then they go, dun, 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 time for the top of the hour radio news. And it was like, you know, five o'clock drive time. So I got this thrill that like, oh man, I just totally, you know, ear fucked 50,000 Austinites on their way home listening to KLBJ. I'm sorry, women and children watching this. I didn't know how else to say it. I got away with making them hear that. And, and that was like probably, you know, the day I decided I'm in radio for life. Now this is, I like that, man. That's um, wonderful. And, and that, and it was right. Like, wasn't that right? And I was like 16 at the time, by the way. Um, and then, but I think that was right. That it was a test to see like, well, how far can we push this really? Do you look how far we pushed it already? And they're cheering for us. Sure. Maybe we'll go ahead and push it a little further. And then, after that, the the uh, military bases, all the gates went wide open for cops to come in for training all across the country. Now, every county has to have a SWAT team. Oh, yeah. And it, Waco was really a turning point for that. There's a clip in um, the Rules of Engagement where one of the guys from ATF says to the Congress, it says, the days of a couple of detectives in three-piece suits or two-piece suits walking up to a door and knocking on it to serve a warrant Our of Lord. any kind yeah. is over. And the reason why is because we stand between the David Koresh's of the world and everybody here. We stand there, law enforcement. Yeah. And so, but what he's really saying is we're sniveling cowards and we're going to pretend to believe that Koresh and his people ambushed us here, and we're going to pretend to believe that that's what every raid is like, and that anytime you serve a warrant on any American, they're all David Koresh and the Branch Davidian madman suicidal cultists who will ambush you and shoot at you and kill you. And so, therefore, the lesson of Waco is SWAT teams for all. And the idea, remember, when I say that, you know what I picture? I picture that old 80s show. I guess you're too young for this. There's a show in the 80s called Hunter. And it's the big, tall, bald guy and his uh, hot brunette partner were the the police, you know, the murder detectives or whatever. And that's what they would do. They could walk up to somebody's door and knock on it and be like, hey, we got a warrant to look around, <laughs> you know. But that seems like some bygone era now. Now it's full spe- special operations, Waco style raids to serve warrants for contraband, serve warrants for deadbeat dads behind on their payments, secure, you know, for anything. For, you know, IRS has SWAT teams to raid businesses in broad daylight who are, you know, they're, what are you doing? We're, Sea fish wholesalers, we, you know, why are you have a SWAT team come? What do you do? You send an accountant. The Department of Education has a SWAT team. That's right. This, oh, this came up recently with Dave brought that up and, and then backed it up. It's just wild. Um, it is. So, and that's what Ron Paul always said. It's like, oh, I'm for gun control for sure. Let's start disarming the federal police agencies. <laughs> you know, these guys really need some gun control big time. Look at how they are. And so it was a real turning point there. And then also... And this may be what he's getting at, proud me to say, is something that I noticed before, you know, in the run up to Iraq War Two. In fact, on February 28th, 2003, the anniversary of the raid, um, I stood out in front of the Texas State Capitol alone with a big sign that said, forget Waco. 
because I was trying to get, which I was just being sarcastic because remember Waco sounds too cheesy, right? I don't want to be like, remember Waco. So I said, forget Waco because everybody already forgot it. Nobody cared about it at all. Or I shouldn't say that. That's not true. But, you know, the public didn't at large and, and power certainly didn't. And but the point of it was this. And I and I did have a guy who was a stringer for the Associated Press come up and interview me and ask me about it. But it, I didn't see his piece reported anywhere after that. But I explained to him that look at what they did to the Branch Davidians. OK, they essentially turned this little strip of property in northeastern Waco into a foreign nation. Right. And they said th- their leader, their their sovereign dictator is crazy. And so you can't talk with him or negotiate with him because he's totally irrational. And he's got these illegal weapons that he's threatening to use against us all. And he's horrible to his own people beating the babies. Yeah, right. Right. And so um, so we have to send the Delta Force in there to kill them all. And how don't you see that's exactly what they're doing to Saddam Hussein right now? We're the USA number one. But we're so terrified of Saddam Hussein that we don't know what we could possibly do except start a war to preempt an attack by Iraq, fourth world nation at that point. that We had already completely obliterated their armed forces a decade before and had under total blockade and sanctions in the decade since. Why can't we just send Colin Powell? He's a former four star general, former joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's the secretary of state. He's not man enough to send over there to face down Saddam Hussein and tell him you better come to heel and sign on the dotted line and do what I say. You're not even going to try. No. You know why? Because he's crazy and evil. And so you can't talk to him. If you talk to him at all, it ratifies him and, and legitimates his power, legitimizes his power. And so you, you can't deal with him at all. And by the way, He's got a bunch of illegal weapons and he's terrible to his own people. And so we got to send in the Delta force to kill them all. And then that's exactly what they did. Yep. And I says to the AP reporter, don't you see that this is the exact same thing they did to Koresh is the exact script that they're playing out on Saddam Hussein now. And by the way, by Koresh, I mean 90 innocent dead people. And by Saddam Hussein, I mean a million of them. Right. Easily. Uh, we got one more super chat from uh, Magoo82. He said, came in late. Scott, what would be your suggestion? I'm, I'm going to take the super chat, and then there's something I want to talk with you about before we close. Another disagreement sure. we had recently. Uh, okay. But Magoo82 says, came in late. Scott, what would be your suggestion to show someone who is still an unapologetic Zionist to get them to see what we know? Yeah, so, okay, you go to libertarianinstitute.org <laughs> or just put in, put in Google libertarianinstitute.org the Waco massacre, uh, and possibly my name, because there, you'll get a lot of results at the Institute, but here's where you start. Okay. That's the question where you start. And what you'll see is you'll know that you're in the right place because it says at the top, some scumbag on Twitter was bad on Waco. And so for revenge, I'm posting all this here for you. Something like that. Like you could tell I was mad when I wrote it. So that's, that's the introduction to it. You'll know you're in the right place there. And then I say here, first of all, is Carol Moore's book, the Davidian Massacre, which is flawless and which is available for free online in its entirety. That's and she's Carol Moore, 1776 on Twitter, a great libertarian activist and uh, wrote this absolutely impeccable book uh, back in the 90s about it. Again, uh, Carol Moore uh, with an E on the end of Moore there. And um, uh, the Davidian Massacre is the book. And then the great James Bovard, all of our hero, one of the greatest libertarian journalists in, you know, in the last two generations. Uh, has an entire archive at jimbovar.org, which includes all of his articles for the Wall Street Journal and everything else he did in the 90s and all through to the current era about Waco. All of it absolutely fantastic. And then, as Josh mentioned previously, Waco, the rules of engagement, and then the sequel, Waco, a new revelation, and then the sequel to that, the FLIR project. And watch all three of those. It's... um, you know, the, the last one is less important, but in the second one, they they have much better, clearer footage of the massacre taking place in the back of the house, uh, a generation or two better quality footage that they found um, to see. 
And they have, you know, better forensic experts talking about the aftermath and all of that. But they also show that the FBI used incendiary rounds, not just pyrotechnic rounds, but incendiary rounds on that morning, military rounds. Now, that started a big fake third cover up. As you said, the, the ATF and Justice Department reports were already cover ups, even in the ways that they differed from each other. But now then here came the Danforth report, Senator John Danforth, and his job was to acquit the FBI all over again. And he did correctly say that, look, these incendiary rounds, they actually shot them into this. this it was like a buried school bus was this underground bunker that was kind of adjacent to the house. It wasn't really connected to the house. And it was at the far side of the house from where the fire broke out hours later. And in fact, here's a picture of one of the incendiary rounds laying in a puddle of water right. after it's long deactivated and spent its fuel. So he was correctly saying there that these incendiary rounds, they're in no way indicate that they're part of the fire. He's right about that. But so what? That's a bait and switch. Red herring, false argument doesn't mean shit. The reality was they found three pyrotechnic rounds that are not, in other words, they're not made to start fires, but they use fire to spread their CS gas. And, um, and so they found at all three origins of the fires, Mike McNulty found these in, uh, pyrotechnic rounds and they all have been mislabeled as silencers in the FBI's um, evidence inventory. And so who cares about the incendiary rounds? The pyrotechnic rounds are still the most likely origins of those fires anyway. And then they also attempted to debunk the flare footage of the men getting out of the backs of the tanks and machine gunning the people, which is as obvious as can be. No one can dispute it. Give me a break. But they tried to. And this is the third documentary, The FLIR Project. That stands for Forward Looking Infrared. This is the footage from the FBI's own plane of that you can see their men and the Delta Force getting out of the back of the tanks and shooting and killing the people as the building burns. And... Um, what they did was they did a test at Fort Hood to replicate it and see if they could get the footage to match. But of course it was a giant fraud. So you know what they did? They took a water truck, you know, that sprays water out of a giant tank. And they took that and drove that over the entire territory to keep all the dust down. Then they gave the soldiers or uh, the cops, whoever was doing the test, gave them rifles with extra long barrels and, Flash suppressant, flash suppressant ammunition that the guys on scene did not have. And then they went, oh, see, it doesn't match. Well, yeah, because you watered down all the dust and you used different rifles and different ammo. Of course it didn't match. But good enough for the nightly news. True. Good enough to bury the subject again. And then so then the third movie, The Fleer Project, shows just what a fraud that was and that the accusations still stand. All right, Scott, I hate to interrupt you, but that super chat was asking about Israel. Uh, Zionists. Unapologetic. Which one? The, the last, so the last question was uh, came in late, Scott. What would be your suggestion, suggestion to show someone who is still an unapologetic Zionist to get them to see what we know? Well, I mean, if, if they're willing to do a little bit of work, get them coming to Palestine by Sheldon Richman. He's a great libertarian. Uh, you know, one of us, his other books are about abolishing government school, legalizing guns and abolishing the IRS. OK, he's our guy and he's raised Jewish Zionist. And now he's not a Zionist because he knows better because he learned a bunch of stuff about it, period. That's it. And you think about what a ridiculous red herring it is that out of six million American Jews that were something like four out of. Uh, 10 of them, or, or, or pardon me, six out of 10 agree with the two state solution and agree that the Palestinians should be given independence, that they all hate themselves, right? The super majority of American Jews are anti-Semitic. Is that the only explanation for their disagreement with the Israeli government's policy? And many of these people are not bleeding hearts for the Palestinians. Many Zionists who support the two state solution. It's not about the, it's not about the Palestinians. It's about their dream of a Jewish ethno state with what it has now inside actual what they call the 67 borders of Israel proper. It's a 
uh, 80-20 super duper majority Jewish state. And under that basis, they can have a Jewish democracy and call it that with a straight face. But not as long as they're occupying the Palestinians, uh, six million Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And, you know, it's essentially half the population have no rights. And so, you know, they annex all that land. But they couldn't cleanse it all, as they call it, the way they did back in 1948 when they kicked 750,000 Palestinians off their land in the first place. By the 70s, it's too late to transfer all these people anywhere. There's nothing you can do. So essentially they kidnap them all and imprison them all. And they just but they want that land. And so you have American Jewish Zionists who are liberals, believe in civil rights, believe that Palestinians should be treated fairly. But most importantly, they believe in a Jewish state. And by annexing all of the territory of Gaza and the West Bank, you're making it essentially only a 50-50 Jewish state and the other 50 percent not. And and the, the vast majority of those, because as I said, a fifth of the population, the citizens of Israel do are essentially second class citizens with some rights. But the rest of the Palestinians in the occupied territories have no rights whatsoever. And we have this this ruse that they're independent, that they're ruled by the Palestinian Authority, Fatah, and ruled by Hamas, you know, in the West Bank and in Gaza. But these are essentially trustees in Israeli prisons, right? These are these are like the chiefs who are put in charge by, of a reservation by the occupying power. They are not, and, and Israel did deliberately help to facilitate the rise of Hamas in the first place to divide and conquer the Palestinians and create a right-wing religious alternative to the secular commie PLO just so that they could do this. And when they withdrew the settlers in 2005, Netanyahu, uh, pardon me, Ariel Sharon's advisor, Dove Weissglass, was criticized for this. How could you give up any territory at all? And he goes, no, see, what we've done is we put the peace process in formaldehyde. They'll never get their Palestinian state now because by withdrawing here, we get to change the entire situation with Gaza, put Hamas in charge next and put them under siege. They've been under siege for 14 years since, totally isolated. And the idea of negotiating away a Palestinian state now is completely, you know, over. It's bankrupt, right? The ruse is canceled. Nobody believes it anymore. That's why the Human Rights Watch, which would never do this, you know, they're, they're propagandists who sometimes support State Department and, and, and uh, Defense Department interventions in other people's countries. In this case, when HRW put out their thing about Israeli apartheid last month, this was them finally conceding to the reality. This was a report that was long overdue. And they finally came out and said, listen, we have to take Netanyahu at his word. He says, Israel will always control all the land west of the Jordan River. Right. So in other words, one state, it's one state. They have de facto annexed the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, all of it back in 67. The, and so now that the ruse is over, now it's outright apartheid. And those are the words of Ehud Barak and Ehud Olmert, the former prime ministers of Israel. That's what they said. If we don't give up a Palestinian state, then we'll have an apartheid state. And then how long is that supposed to last? How long are the people of the world going to tolerate that? It's crazy. And so especially how long are the people of the West going to tolerate that? God damn it. We integrated Alabama 80 years ago. Yeah. Or no, sorry, 60. Sure. But it's still, you know, why are we putting up with this? And we are putting up with it. We're funding every bit of it. We arm every bit of the Israeli military force and security force, and we give them $4 billion a year. And the U.S. government protects them in every way diplomatically and vetoes anything on the U.N. Security Council mandating that they get out of those territories or helps them to ignore the resolutions that already do say that they must withdraw. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. But that's the okay. answer to the question is read Coming to Palestine by Sheldon Richman, and then that's it. Case closed, man. What's happening to these people, it ain't fair. And frankly, if you just think about it for one moment, put the shoe on the other foot. The Palestinian Muslims and Christians had defeated the Israeli Jews over and over again and herded them into these concentration camps. 
treated them in the Gaza Strip like they were living in the Warsaw Ghetto. Well, that would be absolutely intolerable, wouldn't it? And the United States of America would invade and slaughter as many Arabs as it took till the Jews were allowed out of their cages. Simple as that. We wouldn't tolerate that for a day. And yet somehow we can tolerate the Israeli Jews doing this to the Palestinian Muslims and Christians for 54 years longer than the Soviets and fund it long. Yeah. And, and back every bit of it and longer than the Soviets occupied Eastern Europe. It's sickening. It's sickening. You look as Max Blumenthal put it and he went there and saw the war in 2014 with his own eyes. And he said, look at these people locked up in the Gaza Strip. 80% of them refugees from somewhere else. They're not from Gaza. They're from what we call Israel now, right over the fence. And Max Blumenthal says, you see these people? You know why they're locked in this ghetto? Because they were not born Jewish. That's the only reason. Josh, there are no other reasons. Right. That's the reason. They're born with the wrong religion. So they're kept in essentially a concentration camp by the sea where they're, which they're not allowed to fish in, by the way, more than three miles would get bond. You know, it's absolutely insane that this continues. It's just totally wrong. And, and you know what, here's what it is, man. I really believe this. The American people don't know the first thing about it. What the American people know is TV says we're on the side of the Israelis and that the other side are browner and Muslim and from the East and are scary and are terrorists. And so that's it. But that's just a bunch of crap. And as soon as people understand when they look at the map, who's occupying who, who's confiscating land from who and under what ridiculous bogus excuse and the amount of cynicism that goes in to the public relations to justify what the Israelis do, they'll all agree with me. It's just as simple as that. The reason I agree with me now is because I learned about what was really going on over there. You know, the way they portray it is at worst, both sides are invoking uh, God's mandate that the land belongs to them. And so both sides claims are just as illegitimate as the others. You know, if not, the Israelis are, are wonderful and the other guys are all bad guys. You know, at worst, at worst, they have equally disingenuous claims to the territory. But that's just not true. The Palestinians are from there. They have plain old natural rights. John Locke homestead rights. My grandpa owned this farm. He gave it to my dad. He gave it to me. It's mine. Same as anywhere else in the world. Same as anywhere in America. But it's the Israeli Jews who say, no, we have a supernatural property right that supersedes your natural property right. And so it says here that I can confiscate all this land and cleanse the land of whoever's standing in my way and I can move right into your house and it belongs to me. You know, uh, no different than stealing, uh, you know, a, a spot in a barn from a goat. You know, he doesn't have any rights. You're bound to respect. You can move him over and sleep in his spot if you feel like. And that's the way that they treat these people. And And based on what? Based on the idea that their great, great grandparents to the 10th power 2000 years ago had been from there. Well, that's absolutely preposterous. And under that logic, of course, that means that any ethnic group anywhere in the world could go and conquer and confiscate and kill civilians and imprison people, torture people and do all these things to take back land that their ancient mythology says where they're from. That would mean that Hitler had the right to invade e Eastern Europe to recreate the ancient state of the Grand Teutons where, you know, the original Germanic right. tribes that had come from the east. Or that would mean that Italians in northern New Jersey would have the right to go to Sicily and kick people out of their homes and kill them and confiscate their property, move in and say, yeah, but my grandfather's from here. My great grandfather came from Sicily. So I have the right to take it away from the people who live there now. It's completely bananas. It's completely crazy. And, and the argument doesn't hold up. And that's why all you ever hear from the Israelis is a bunch of cynical dishonesty, a bunch of ridiculous metaphors and analogies that never hold up. Oh, you know what? Let's stop talking about who's occupying who in Palestine. Let's pretend, Josh, that what if Mexico was attacking San Diego? Well, but now we're not talking about Israel and Palestine anymore. Now we're talking about an analogy that doesn't hold up at all. Mexico is a sovereign nation state, you know, and so. 
their security forces attacking our civilian population is an entirely different matter than, say, if the Navajo start firing homemade rockets over the wall of their reservation at the security forces, you know, the violent security forces of the United States government occupying them and surrounding them. That's an entirely different analogy. That's a much more apt analogy, but it's one you'll never hear from Zionists. But you'll always hear them talk in analogies. You'll always hear them talk in metaphors because they can't talk about who's occupying whom. They can't talk about how, okay, yes, it's true that the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and UPI, and Bob Dreyfus, and Jeremy R. Hammond, and, and Patrick Coburn, and everybody else in the world has shown that yes, Israel deliberately abetted the rise of Hamas just so that they could say, we don't have to deal with them, they're right-wing religious terrorists. Mm. Everybody knows that. It's in the goddamn Wall Street Journal for Christ's sake. Stop pretending that we don't all know that that's true. Andrew Higgins, by the way, if you're looking for the footnote there. So in fact, maybe that's a good place to start, right? Hey, look, Ma, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and UPI, And don't even get me started on Haaretz and the Times of Israel and all the Israeli publications that all say that Israel deliberately created Hamas or helped to facilitate the rise of Hamas just to divide the Palestinians, just so they could lie to and manipulate you and say, well, we have no partner for peace because they're all a bunch of terrorists. Yeah, of course. That's why they don't want a partner for peace. They want that land. They're land rustlers. That's what they are. That's what they're doing. And their excuses are crap. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't disagree with you at all. So I'm not even going to try. But uh, before we get going uh, out of here, I wanted to talk about the other thing that we argued about on Twitter briefly. Actually, had a, there was a long thread about, Nic- oh. about Nicholas uh-huh. Sarwark. Okay. Yes. Um, I So... Uh, a long time ago, when I was running for chair the first time in 2018, when I was running against Nick Sarwark, uh, WikiLeaks released this 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 list of names from um, God. Now I'm going to forget the damn name of the Stratford. Stratford, right? Yeah. And what was released was said to be assets, or or said to be by who? By by WikiLeaks in the WikiLeaks release. That's what it said. No, uh-uh. well, yeah, that's and and that's so- show me that. Actually, I think someone just posted the uh, the article from Free Thought that had the list on it. Well, let me see. I read the Free Thought Project article. It's crap, and I love Matt Agaris. I promote his work every single day of my life. I think he's great, and I don't know. I don't even think he's the author of that piece. No, but I that don't piece think is either. pure garbage. That piece doesn't have any. I've never seen. Listen, you know what? Let it does. I got time. I got time. You find for me where WikiLeaks said. That's what I'm gonna look for right now. Because I think that's not true, Josh. I don't think WikiLeaks ever said that at all. And the only argument I've ever heard about what WikiLeaks said was, well, WikiLeaks said it's the global intelligence files. Well, that doesn't mean anything. That's just the title of the leak. They called the Iraq war logs the Iraq war logs. And they call the Afghan war logs the Afghan war diary. It's the same thing. It's military cables. They called the Gitmo leak the Guantanamo files. They called the Apache collateral damage video collateral murder. It's just a headline. At no point did they say the names on this XL file, or was it XML file, are people who are informants for Stratfor. And if you can show me that, I'll give you 50 bucks. Oh, man, 50 bucks is nice. I'm not going to lie. Because this is, listen, this is the same thing as David Shipman standing over a burning corpse. Well, I don't know. Somebody said so, and I like it. But it's total crap. And listen, if you go to WikiLeaks.org, in fact, go to Google and type in site colon WikiLeaks.org space Sarwark, you'll get three results. And all three are essentially the same thing. And all it is is a list of names and mailing addresses. Sure. There is no indication whatsoever that these are people who work for us. And in fact, one of them is labeled something like holiday mailing list. Uh, Maybe not one of them. Maybe two out of the three of them say like these are people. And then when when asked about it, what did Nick Sarwak say? He says, my brother-in-law signed me up. 
for a subscription to their mailing list for magazine. a Christmas present. Their mag- his mag- their magazine. Yeah, to their magazine. Yeah, yeah which is a 150% plausible explana- explanation, and you ain't got shit. You ain't got shit other than, well, it's called the Global Intelligence Files. So one of those emails is, hey, Becky, are you coming over later? We're going to go out to Starbucks. Does that mean that everybody at Starbucks works for the CIA? True. Which, by the way, Stratfor is not the CIA. No. All this is is a dump of goddamned emails from Stratfor employees emailing each other, including here are the people on our goddamned mailing list, Josh. So I can't find what and you're, do you I have can't find what you're talking about. Any other indication, so, any indication whatsoever so, that. Anything there says that he works for them, has ever even contacted them for any purpose whatsoever. No, and I'm going to tell so let me tell you. So when, when this first came out, when I was running for chair, I actually defended Nick. Okay. I don't well, like, good. I don't like, you Nick. know, when this first came out, I told certain friends of ours that this is stupid bullshit. And guess what? Who is the judge of what is stupid bullshit or not, Josh? I am. Okay. <laughs> Fair. That's what I'm doing here tonight. Right. Okay. I'm telling you, this is bullshit. Don't use this against him. This is Infowars, trutherism, crap. Sure. This is pure speculation without proof. And what happens when you speculate without proof? You get it wrong. Right. You get it wrong. And so then what do you do? You make him the good guy, just like David Chipman. This guy, Nick Sarwark, people have plenty of honest disagreements with. But what makes him a good guy? More than any other thing is that he's defending himself from false accusations. And I forgot who taught me this, but somebody told me a few weeks ago, he's like a second or even a third generation libertarian party member. There's his folks are libertarian party well, people. Though. He's been in the libertarian party his whole life. Ugh, I don't, when did he, and then he was a defense attorney. Tell me when he went out to the farm and got recruited into COINTELPRO. This is all bullshit. And by the way, Stratfor ain't the CIA. I know that. Stratfor is George Friedman, who is mostly like, it's mostly a bunch of open source information sure. that they compile into subscription only intelligence briefings for their audience, just like a hundred other firms. And you know what? Actually, I think they're involved in some dirty tricks. Uh, I think they do, you know, from time to time do, you know, operations to undermine people and, and some things like that. But Boy, I'll tell you what, in my book, I cite them on two huge things from those same global intelligence files. And that is one, Bill Clinton's acquiescence to uh, the Saudis backing the terrorists in Chechnya in the uh, 1990s. And then also um, American and NATO intervention in Syria at the end of 2011, which was is much earlier on the timeline than many would have you believe. And, and they have an extensive report on that. So they, you know, they collect intelligence and this and that, but to say, you know, to just conflate them with the CIA is not right. True. And, and, and to presume that anybody whose name is on that list is somehow an asset of, of Stratfor, much less the federal government is just totally bogus. Dude. True. It's just yeah. it. And so, like I said, I, I, you know, back in the day I used to defend him, but then it got, it got harder and harder as I worked with the guy on, on the board because of the way, the way he acted to me was not somebody who was there to grow a movement in the party. So for me, it looked like, and, and I, and, and I've, I've never said it. I've never cemented it that you, you're from the CIA. You're from this. It always did seem weird to me that he got involved with the Libertarian Party in Maryland where he's not from. Then all of a sudden he moved to Colorado and started taking, trying to take over the party there. Then he moved to Arizona, started trying to run for national leadership. And, and there's the, yes, there is the, these, uh, they say that he's a generational libertarian, that his parents, but then some information came out that his parents were actually registered, registered Democrat. So that was another thing that kind of messed with me really bad. And then, and then working with the guy closely, it became harder and harder to defend him from those accusations because of the things that I saw him do over time, the dirty backroom bullshit, the, the, the obvious grabs at trying to keep the party small. Uh, yeah, but you see it. how that, so, I mean, those things just don't follow. For me, you know, as I said, this it, guy Chipman, this guy Chipman from the ATF right. ought to have all of his prop, all of his property confiscated and ought to be kicked out of the United States of America forever. 
Yeah, okay, you know, yeah. At, yeah, or or given life in prison. I guess I would settle for locking him in the supermax. But that doesn't mean that he's the guy in the trophy photo. Sure. <laughs> Just has nothing to do with sure. it. Okay? You know, so I got my problems with Nick Sarwak too. I've made his acquaintance. I tried to get along with him. He doesn't seem to want to get along with me too bad. But Shocking. I don't have a personal beef with the guy. I don't participate in any of you guys' Twitter fights and that kind of stuff. So I'm out, I'm out of all of that. And I thought, you know, in Pennsylvania, I had an opportunity to, you know, have a friendly little discussion with him up there and whatever and, and try to actually, you know, build bridges between, you know, our our group and, you know, his allies in the movement, which he does have. And and to show them that, you know, it's not all just fangs and fighting here and that there's a lot that we can agree on. But I'll tell you, in talking with him, I think he really believes this, too. That, well, you and you and you, you guys are all, not me, but he was talking to me, but he was talking about you guys in the Mises caucus saying, well, you guys are totally disingenuous. You know, you don't care about liberty at all. You just care about hating him. You just care about fighting him. And look at the proof of how personal it is, is after he lost and is not the chair of the party and is not even the treasurer or anything else, you still won't leave him alone. And it's all about him. It's all about hate. And it doesn't even have anything to do with liberty. And then I said to him, but dude, that's what they say about you. That you're totally disingenuous. You don't care about any of this at all. All you care about is fighting against them. And I think both of y'all, as we're discussing here, use disingenuous attacks against each other in service of what you think is doing the right thing. I saw a thing today where he had a quote that I know he knows because I discussed it with him, is not a Ron Paul quote. It's something out of those newsletters that somebody else wrote, whether it was Jeff Tucker or, or this guy James Powell, as uh, Ben Swan documented, most of the worst stuff in there was by a guy named James Powell, whoever that is. Um, Starwalk knows that Ron Paul didn't write that. So here he's using a disingenuous attack against you in what he thinks is in the service of a greater good, is protecting the Libertarian Party from you crazy right-wing deviationists who are trying to come in and take over the thing. That's what he thinks he's doing. He's fighting for truth and justice and liberty against you crazies. And what's the proof that you're crazy? All you ever do is call him a goddamn CIA agent. You think the fucking CIA is going to bother infiltrating the LP and controlling its chairman? Is that what you think the CIA does, Josh? No. That's fucking stupid, man. And for and I'm sorry, I'm not just attacking you, but you're sitting in place of my faction, sure, my sure. friends, the Mises Caucus. Yeah. That is a disingenuous attack. And, you know, one quarter of the time people say, no, it's just a joke. It's just a meme. Everybody knows it's not true. It's just a good way to get under skin and make fun of them because we don't like the guy. And so it's just a meme. And then the other three quarters of the time they say, no, it is too true because it's in the WikiLeaks. It's in the strat for it says right there. Well, what does it say right there? It says his name and address. That's what it says. That's all it says. And then, so what's the difference? What is the goddamn difference? We, our side is attacking him with lies. And then he turns around and says, here's a quote of Ron Paul that he didn't actually say. Sure. It's the same thing. And both of y'all think that you're doing the right thing and you're both doing the wrong thing. You know, and right before this tonight, I was defending the John Birch Society, who I don't really favor because the last time I liked them was when Will Grigg was with them, but they fired Will Grigg for being too good for them back in 2006. And Will is my guy. He came to work with me at the Libertarian, he's a co-founder of the Libertarian Institute with me before he died. And so this lady was attacking the John Birchers and saying that they support eugenics. And then someone said, well, what's the proof of that? And she has these screenshots of titles of productions of things that the Birchers had done with the name eugenics in it. But actually, even if you look right there, it says the evil racist eugenics agenda. And I happen to know about the Birchers because I used to read The New American when Will Grigg was the editor of it in the 1990s religiously that opposing eugenics is actually one of their specialities. This is something that they know a lot about. And it's something that, as you may know, was a major facet of the progressive movement in America 100 years ago and was a major part of the inspiration for Adolf Hitler and his Nazis doing the same thing in Germany. And that's true. You know, when the Nazis would tie down a woman and cut her ovaries out, it was called the Indiana Procedure. 
Okay, that's where that stuff comes from is here. And the birchers have always used that as a cudgel against the Eastern establishment that they hate so much. Right. If you guys are so PC, explain to me why Margaret Sanger talked about how the best way to get rid of blacks is through abortions and sterilizations because there's too many of the dysgenic stock around here and all this stuff. So it's the birchers actually not just are against eugenics, but this is like one of their niches. Is they're one of the best on opposing eugenics. They're one of the best groups that you could find who have the footnotes from every magazine and every periodical and every newspaper and every book and everything anybody said about eugenics in the last 120 years. They are the masters of this subject and they're good as hell on it. And so this liberal lady misunderstood, honest misunderstanding, although she was jumping to a conclusion, she knows that the John Birchers are right-wingers. Well, right-wingers means racists, and racists means Nazis, and Nazis means pro-eugenics. So the Birchers, therefore, she's just certain, are pro-eugenics. What a bunch of Nazis. But this is all in her head. So somebody tagged me in a response to her and said, well, I heard Will Grigg, who's cited in her screenshots there from some old stuff that he'd done for them, um, I heard Will Grigg on the Scott Horton show many times and he seemed like a great man to me. So I don't know why you're smearing him lady, but thanks for bringing him up. It brought a smile to my <laughs> face, which I thought was nice. Yeah. That guy was like, yeah, good old Will Grigg, right? Thanks for reminding me of him. I don't care what shit you talk. It's cool. Um, but then, so I corrected her and I just said, listen, I'm sure that this is an honest misunderstanding and it's, this is not my crew. Okay. The, the John Birchers, but I'm just saying, look, that's my job. I defend Koresh. I defend the Ayatollah, I defend Saddam Hussein and Bashar al-Assad and Muammar Gaddafi and um, uh, old uh, uh, Abdullah Saleh in Yemen. And I defend David Shipman when people are lying about him. And I defend Nick Sarwak when people are lying about him. And I'll defend the John Birchers. The John Birchers are as PC as you could be without exploding on the issue of genetics. Sorry if that confuses you. Sorry if that causes cognitive dissonance in your head because of all the conclusions that you jump to about them, but it's just not true. And I'm not even just talking about Will Grigg, but I'm speaking about the who's, you know, quit again, was fired from there in 2006, but still, the entire organization. And I sent her a link to the Google search results for the word eugenics at the newamerican.com, their magazine. Right. And then there's like 500 results of absolute rabid opposition to eugenics and an article after article of them pointing the finger and accusing other people of supporting it, right? Especially leftists, right? They, they accuse the left of supporting eugenics for supporting abortions, which disproportionately affect blacks, you know? And so they're saying, you're the racist, not us. You support abortion, then you support disproportionately killing black babies. That's their position. And then it's funny. I like the cognitive dissonance here. The one guy goes, look at all these white people who come to defend the birchers. As though we're saying eugenics is great and, and thank goodness the birchers also support it. When that's not true. We're saying it's not true. And here's a picture of Will Grigg who's made out of four different racial identities, maybe more, who's clearly not a white guy, right. you know? Um, and so that's my job, man, is defending people from false accusations. And there, and look, you know, I probably have a thing about this because I've been caught screwing up before. I've been caught having, you know, I can't think of a really great example, but I'm sure that I must have like accused somebody of something. And then I was refuted and felt like an idiot. And, I, and for a guy who is a professional opinion haver for a living in public, I hate hate being embarrassed, dude. I just want to crawl in a hole and die. If I get something wrong and somebody points it out and I mean, I will always admit it. I, I will not be like these idiots and cling to their falsehood rather than admit I made a mistake because I got to be right tomorrow. I don't care if I'm right today as much as being right from now on. But if I am embarrassed, Ooh, I take embarrassment bad. And so what's a really good way to prevent that? You don't retweet unless you know that it really says what the guy says it says. Sure. You know, you don't run off with an accusation against people that you don't know whether it's true or not. And again, you know, you think Nick Sarwak's such a bad guy. One of the best defenses that he has against his opponents 
is that they falsely accuse him of things, that they don't deal with him on an honest and rational basis. Now, you could say that's how he is, too. I think I agree with that to a degree. But as I say, he's making the same argument as you, essentially, that the price is worth it. And the means the ends justify the means to deal dishonestly with people. But if our side and his side would both drop that and just argue about what we actually disagree with and presume that the other guy is here because he thinks America ought to be a free country and a hell of a lot freer than it is right now and that it matters, maybe we could find a lot of things to um, come together about. And one of his major arguments against you guys is it's all talk and no work. But you know what? Like, Maybe we really need to get to work collecting signatures for ballot access. Maybe we really need to be running a lot of Mises guys for offices around the country. And maybe we do spend too much time on Twitter and really should be doing more activism. Maybe we could put the lie to that by making it not true, true. or making it less true, you know? And so, and then that'll undermine that argument. And then we'll move on to the next one, yep. you know? All right, man, we're getting really close to the show, but we did get one more super chat, and I want to bring this up because it's a very important issue to me. It's something that I still don't think is talked about enough. The Wars of Morals said, uh, ask Scott to talk about Yemen to maybe a new audience. We have to bring the worst things we're doing to an end. Uh, so just a few words about Yemen, what's going on there, why we need to make sure that it's talked about more than it is. Well, we're six years and three months into the war, the latest phase of the war there. And it's the worst war in the world, Josh. It's the worst thing in the world right now. It's They call it the Saudi-led coalition. Um, it's under the Obama theory from Libya. Remember, leading from behind. We let everybody else take the responsibility. But it's America's war. And the Yemenis aren't confused about that. They call it the American-Saudi war. USA is the world empire. Saudi Arabia is our client state. And America is backing them and has been backing them since March of 2015 in a war of deliberate genocide. Now, I got to tell you, the Americans have waged some brutal wars in the last 20 years. And they've gotten a hell of a lot of innocent people killed. And what they consider to be acceptable rates of collateral damage, Josh, are unacceptable. OK, but that's not the same as this. In this case, the Saudis, with American complicity, are deliberately targeting every last bit of the civilian infrastructure of the country. They bomb the waterworks, they bomb the sewage, they bomb the garbage, they bomb the electricity, they bomb the hospitals. They have precipitated the worst cholera, cholera outbreaks in recorded history, worse even than those inflicted on the people of Iraq by George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton in the early 90s. Um, thousands of people have died of cholera, an easily treatable disease if you have clean water, which they don't. And then they bomb the cholera hospitals in the middle of the worst outbreak, I mean, tens of thousands of people sick, uh, you know, an emergency uh, situation. And then and they bomb the farms. They bomb the grain silos. They bomb the tractors and the mules and the horses in their stables. They bomb the irrigation ditches and everything that makes agriculture possible. They bomb the marketplaces. They bomb all the trucks and all the fuel. And they've got the whole country under total blockade. And so, and they essentially ban, and with the U.S. Navy's help, essentially have banned all international trade other than humanitarian aid. And even then, they hold up the humanitarian aid in the name of inspections for extended periods of time so that all the food spoils and the people can't get it. And so... Um, the official count as of, I think now, two years ago, two and a half years ago, was 233,000. So a quarter of a million people dead. And I guarantee you it's above 750,000 is the real number. And uh, by the time it's all said and done and we have a real count of the excess death rate and all of that, you'll see that it's more than a million people are, have been killed in this war, man. And um, uh, almost indisputably. The United Nations predicts that this year, and not by the end of the year, but already in progress, and I think the, I forget now, I think the estimate was like by the end of the summer, they expect 400,000 children under the age of five to die of famine. Deliberately inflicted famine. What do you call it, Josh? It's a humanitarian when, crisis. I mean, it's it's more than just a war at this point, for sure. Yeah. 
what do you do when one nation is deliberately inflicting a famine on the civilian population of another nation? That's a genocide. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that under our law is a felony, is a war crime. It's against the Geneva Conventions. It's against the UN Charter. It's against the any authority that the U.S. Constitution grants to our government. And they have no authorization for this war whatsoever. They, they want to hide behind the authorization to use military force against al-Qaeda and associated groups. Well, this is the war for al-Qaeda and associated groups. America was waging the war against al-Qaeda 2009 through 15. But once the Houthis took over the capital city, Obama switched sides in the war and took al-Qaeda and Saudi and UAE side against them. That's the war we're talking about now. The drone war before is nothing compared to this. And it's absolutely the worst thing in the world. And uh, Donald Trump continued it for four years straight, justified it by citing money. Oh, the Saudis spent so much money. Guess what, Josh? The Saudis spent $450 billion on our weapons here. And so we got to do this. But that's such a lie. They spent about $3 billion a year on American weapons. Three measly stinking billion dollars, which is equivalent to the gross domestic product of a county in Florida somewhere, right? That that our economy is dependent on this revenue, that that the American people, the 300 million of us got to be turned into blood soaked mercenaries for three billion measly stinking dollars to divide among us. Is that how that works when it's no, it's just the Raytheon employees and and uh, and shareholders who get that money. And it's, uh, you know, worth uh, maybe at most 10,000, 20,000 jobs in the country. Donald Trump claims it's a million jobs, a million American jobs. So we're mercenaries. That's what the USA is. We kill people for money. And by the way, we're making about a 1% of what our president says we're making off of this. But that'll be good enough for you anyway. And that's why he continued the war for four years straight, $450 billion. Give me a break. And then Biden swore he was going to end it. And he came in and he didn't end it. They claimed that they ended it. They, they came in and they said, well, we're ending all resupply of, you know, uh, weapons, bombs and whatever. We're ending all uh, maintenance support for their air force. And we're ending all logistics and, you know, intelligence support for their logistics and their targeting and all of that. We're calling all of that off. And, and we're insisting we're stopping all support for Saudi's offensive war in Yemen. We will, however, continue to back, you know, Patriot missile systems and Iron Dome type systems and defensive missiles to repel uh, Houthi drones and missile attacks over the border into Saudi Arabia. But then at the beginning of March, Admiral Kirby, the spokesman for the Pentagon, admitted that maintenance support for the Saudi Air Force continues. Those are American F-15s they're flying. Like, oh, I think about a quarter or a third of their Air Force are British typhoons maintained by the BAE systems. Um, or just BAE systems, not the. Um, but Kirby said, nope, we're still, we still have our guys maintaining their Air Force. So without that, the war's over. The Saudis' little princelings don't maintain their own F-15s. They need American contractors to do that. And so if Obama called all that off, it would be over. And for all I know, I guess we have to presume if they're still providing the maintenance, they must still be selling them bombs. They must still be helping with the logistics and intelligence, presumably. That's speculation, but no reason to believe they really called off any of it at all. And then they sent this guy Lender King over there to be the um, you know special envoy to negotiate an end. But he's Saudi Arabia's lawyer, man. He's not working for peace here. And there's an excellent new piece in foreignpolicy.com by this lady from the Quincy Institute. I'm going to try to interview her tomorrow if I can. Um, and it's all about the UN Security Council resolution that all negotiations are based off of is the American and British and Saudi constructed resolution that says the Saudis must def admit defeat and go home. Well, that ain't going to happen. The Houthis have won the war. The Houthis haven't lost. They've done nothing but gain this whole time. Well, and that's not true. They took um, Aiden and then they withdrew from Aiden back in like 2016, 17. But they're they're making major progress in Marib right now. And um, and they just are in the position of strength here. There's no reason in the world that they would give in 
to the currently constructed demands of the Americans and so and the Saudis. And so the war just continues. It's absolutely intolerable. I mean, the entire country, the entire United States of America should be on general strike right now. This is what are we doing? This is a genocide against the civilian population of a country and a regime that never threatened us, that never attacked us. Our only enemies in Yemen are Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. But that's not what this war is. This is the war for them. They've now been integrated into the UAE's, uh, you know, militia force on the ground there. They're protected. Even CNN, and, and I mean even CNN, um, you know, confirmation bias and all, but it was solid reporting. CNN showed that UAE was giving them American armored personnel carriers, MRAPs, to go drive around in and use in battle. Uh, that America is directly arming the guys who helped coordinate the September 11th attack, the guys who bombed the USS Cole and tried to bomb the Sullivans and who uh, coordinated, who who sent Abdul Mutalab, uh, Mutalab, to uh, do the underpants bomb over Detroit in 2009, which by the way, the Americans deliberately let him into the country because they wanted to follow him around and they almost got a plane exploded over a major American city for their negligence. Um, and then they also, these guys were behind the Charlie Hebdo attack and a couple of the other massacres in France, I think in Nice and the, the um, uh, Eagles of Death Metal concert in the mid uh, 2010s there, you know, five, six years ago. That's who these guys are, ruthless, real-ass Osama bin Ladenite al-Qaeda terrorists. And that's the side we're fighting for against a government and a population that did nothing to us, nothing. Sure, sure. Man, every time. Every time I have you on, I learn a million things, Scott. I really do. Everyone needs to go check out Scott's newest book, Enough Already, for sure, uh, if you don't have that. And Fool's Aaron, those are the, the two books that I have. Um, you have other books as well, Scott. Uh, but I wrote the great Ron Paul yeah. is a collection of all my interviews of Ron Paul too. Yeah, absolutely. But th those are the, the, the enough already. And, and fool's Aaron, go get those today. If you want to learn more uh, than you've ever thought you could know about the wars in the middle East and Afghanistan. Absolutely. Scott, where can, uh, the good people that follow my show find you and support you, sir. Okay. Well, uh, antiwar.com is the most important project on the internet. Uh, I'm the editorial director there. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, which I'm pretty dang proud of as well. That's me and Sheldon Richmond and Pete Quinones, Kyle Anzalone and uh, Keith Knight and uh, more great libertarian writers and podcasters and all that. That's at libertarianinstitute.org. My show is at scotthorton.org. And I've got 5,500 interviews going back to 2003 there wow. at scotthorton.org. And... Um, also, the whole archive is also at youtube.com slash Scott Horton show. And you can listen to me on the radio in Los Angeles on Sunday mornings on KPFK 90.7 FM. Nice, nice. Yeah, well, last time we last time we were on, uh, you and I talked a little bit about beefing up your show and stuff after the show. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, doing, yeah. Doing a live show and all that stuff maybe someday. So that that's a, some cool stuff to look out for from uh, Scott. Scott, man, I appreciate the hell out of you. I really do. I don't think. Thank you, Josh. I don't Happy think there's any, if, if anyone close to as good as you are on just about everything, man. So we, we really appreciate that's true. you. <laughs> appreciate that, dude. Absolutely, brother. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll see you soon, I'm sure. All right, guys. Another successful episode of Break the Cycle. Scott is the man. I could literally say I, I could have sat here till midnight talking to Scott and listening to what he has to say. I, I it's just never gets old to me. I love it so much. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Uh, thank you to all the super chats and the awesome questions uh, for for Scott. Um, he, he sometimes I don't ask the right one, so I'm glad that you guys did. Uh, definitely check out our sponsors at Lorenzotti.coffee uh, for all your delicious Italian coffee needs delivered directly to your door. Bring the taste of Italy home. Use BTC for at checkout for a 10% discount. Of course, toplobster.com where you can get this great hat, this great shirt, this great pillow, and all kinds of awesome hand-drawn graphics uh, on, on shirts and hats and backpacks and boots, and I don't know what else he has there. He's got a lot of stuff. Use BTC at checkout for a 10% discount. Of course, anthemplanning.com for all of your emergency crisis and planning needs check them out executive producers show wonderful people uh coming up on the show i have uh tomorrow uh friday yeah tomorrow is friday i will have uh adam kokesh on the show 
We're going to talk a lot of crazy things. For those of you who don't know, I actually spent two weeks on the bus with Adam Kokesh uh, during my chair campaign in 2018. He's a wild man, but it was fun. Uh, Monday, we're going to have Nick Ashley from the Individualist Podcast, also the man who helped me get all of my wonderful audio uh, in line. Finally, Wednesday, we will have Angela McArdle, uh, my candidate for LNC chair, uh, that's going to be an interesting and fun conversation as somebody who ran to try and take that chair position for the last four years, basically. Um, I'm very excited for that. And then on Friday of next week, we'll have Olivia Rondau, uh, big time college wrestler, uh, hardcore conservative libertarian. I'm very excited to have her on the show. She is awesome. I've been following her for a while. Um, guys, do me a favor. Check out the Patreon. Help me keep this show afloat. Uh, check out patreon.com backslash break the cycle JS. If you hate Patreon because they're really yeety, you can check out, uh, subscribe star, same thing, subscribe star.com backslash, uh, break the cycle JS. There are some really cool tiers on there. We're adding a new tier, uh, not a new tier, a, a new perk to all the tiers. If you become a supporting member of the, uh, Patreon for break the cycle, you will now get uh, first dibs on top lobster gear before it goes out to the general public at a very discounted price. So that's just one more cool perk. There's already a lot of cool perks on there. Uh, of course you can also join the memberships for the YouTube channel. Now, uh, it's very cheap. You get, uh, really, it's, it's, so there are badges now, special badges for all you wonderful people who are always in the chat, uh, which is going to be really cool. And there's going to be different levels for how long you've been a member of the channel. And then there's going to be some really cool custom emojis you can use to talk smack in the chat, all drawn by, uh, the wonderful Mr. Top Lobster, of course. So with that said, I will see you guys tomorrow night with, for the show with Adam Kokesh, but until then. Don't forget to break the cycle. Due to legal reasons, I just have to explain. The lyrics of my last song may seem to contain a violent call to action in the verse and refrain. But I just stand in Minecraft. The helicopter part was in reference to. GTA 5 and the things you do So any violence you commit I am not an excuse Because I just meant it in Minecraft Well, Chipper is my friend And he's constantly cold Accusations of incitement getting totally old Make your own choices, yeah, you have control Because I just meant it in Minecraft Obviously I would never advocate force Unless there's due process and a trial, of course And if you're convicted, we will make you a corpse In Minecraft, just in Minecraft There are nothing I mean, you know it Don't try to finish, cause you're close to COVID Holy shit, I think I'll post